Let's take a look at uh, Revelation chapter 20, and we're picking up with verse 7 this week. When the thousand years were completed, Satan will be released from his prison. Now, whether that thousand years would be 1,000 years exactly at the end of the church age, or the church age is open for debate, or one other possibility I noticed one author suggested. In essence, it has little to do with earth, <coughs> in his point of view. But it was a, you know, a millennial-like condition, that is, a heaven-like condition. And the point he was making was, this is the uh, uh, location or place of the saints who experienced the, re the resurrection. In other words, this is that intermediate state condition in heaven. So the millennium is that pre-heaven paradise that uh, these have experienced. And that's another uh, and a reasonable point of view. But... Uh, Satan is released. And will come out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together for the war. The number of them is like the sand of the seashore. Now, remember, Satan was bound that he might not deceive the nations. And now that he is released, his goal is to receive the nations. Deceive the nations. And he proceeds to attempt to do so and is amazingly successful in his efforts. That would show that, you know, if the millennium were here on this earth, and it was a changed earth in some sense because of the influence of the gospel, but this would suggest that there was a lot of phoniness in this millennium, in that Satan has very little trouble. He's not confronted by a powerful uh, resistance from the hearts of men. But in fact, they're very successful in deceiving the great, the masses of the globe. And uh, uh, that's, you know, troubling, to, to say the least, that he is so capable of bringing the, the nations of the globe uh, into bondage to his evil message. Um, and four corners of the earth tell us it's a worldwide phenomenon. And then he mentions Gog and Magog, to gather them together for the war. Now Gog and Magog come out of the uh, book of Ezekiel, chapters 38 and 39. And there's been a great deal of nonsensical talk about who they are. A lot of it's based on childlike sounds as to the, uh, you know, the, the sound of the words, Gog and Magog, and other uh, words in Ezekiel how they uh, sound like similar cities and similar countries in our 20th and 21st century. That's why I call it just silly nonsense. Uh, <clears throat> nobody that I can read in the ancient you know, you know, world, uh, including the Jews, really knew what Ezekiel was talking about. We don't particularly even know that John is being specific to the message of Ezekiel. In other words, John is not necessarily saying what uh, Ezekiel talked about, I'm going to carry that message on and tell you a little bit more about Gog and Magog. I think what John, in fact, is doing is using uh, hot terms, so to speak, that have an impact, and they are embraced for the impact. For instance, John has a, a history of doing this. Uh, he uses the word Jezebel that comes out of, of course, the Old Testament to refer to a person who's in one of the churches. And was it one and the same Jezebel? No, it was entirely different. But this was a term that su suited his purpose. There was something in the, the life of this person in that first century similar to the life of the original Jezebel, and he made the connection for that reason. He uses the term Sodom in the book of Revelation to refer to Jerusalem. 
and he's not referring directly to Sodom, which has long since been destroyed, but there's something about that Sodom and something about Jerusalem, that the similarities of which allowed him to acquire that term for, for this purpose. He does the same thing with Egypt and with Babylon. Uh, acquires the use of these terms, not because he's saying Jerusalem is Egypt or Babylon, but because he's saying there's the characteristics of evil associated with these countries, uh, cities, fit Israel and Jerusalem when he wrote. Now he's uh, he, uh, doing that again, I think, with Gog and Magog. Because Gog and Magog, to say Gog and Magog are coming would be like, you know, 30 or 40 years ago, to say the Russians are coming. It is an emotional response you get. You know, the communists are coming. And uh, uh, people respond to those hot terms, you see, emotionally. And so uh, John is using ancient enemies of Israel. And, I, and like I say, ancient enemies of Israel, but nobody's quite sure who they were. Even, you know, even in John's day. We know that because we can search the literature of uh, non-biblical literature, the Talmud and other similar Mishnah and all this Jewish literature. They talk about Gog and Magog all the time, I might add. And uh, uh, they don't particularly have any idea of the original, so to speak. It's eschatological, just as John is using eschatological great battle at the end of time, in some sense. But they don't know who it was. I want to suggest that Gog and Magog, who come down from the north, is um, <clears throat> a, a typical terminology for a Jew to use in this sense. Virtually every enemy came from the north. I say virtually because there were uh, rare exceptions that uh, Egypt would come from the south. But Egypt was never much of an enemy of Israel for the most part. Uh, Egypt always wanted Israel to be there. Egypt wanted a buffer between itself and anybody else, and so they were more than pleased to, you know, support Israel to be that buffer. They were traditionally really not a, 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 an enemy of Israel. The enemies that came always came from the, the north. Not that Babylon, which came from the north, was in the north. In fact, you look at a map, it's directly east. You can almost draw a, a straight line east out of Jerusalem to hit Babylon. But Babylon couldn't cross, and nobody would cross the Arabian Desert to get to them. So what would they do? They would follow what they call a fertile crescent. That area between the Tigris and the Euphrates River. Uh, and the armies would march along where they can get food and water and such like, up to the very northern part of uh, Iraq today, or Syria, and then they would turn and, again, follow the road system down into Israel. So the enemies always came from the north, no matter if they were from the north or not. They may have been from the north, Turkey and things of this nature, which have ancient enemies in that area that would also come in this direction. But enemies coming from the north, and Gog and Magog, uh, having been identified in some sense actually with Turkey, uh, these terms were acquired, I think, by John to say there's going to be a great enemy descending upon Israel. Any questions about that so far? <clears throat> and they came, verse 9, up on the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city and fire came down from heaven and devoured them. Now there's some real issues here, or at least there are for me. Because this passage, in the verse we just read, is filled with terminology that is local to Israel. And Israel's history. Uh, the camp of the saints, the beloved city. Uh, Gog and Magog descending from the north uh, and coming upon Israel. That's all very geographic in nature. And so that uh, makes it very easy for those who would want to say, well, at the end of time, there's a great battle, 
in Israel. Uh, and in reference to Jerusalem specifically. And that in some way, shape, or form, there's the, you know, uh, Jerusalem plays a role, or perhaps the temple plays a role in the eschatology of the Bible. And this is proof of it because there's this great battle that occurs in that geographic location. And you can see how they could make a case, a reasonable case, for that. A couple of things you want to note, however, and a lot of people get confused about this. This battle right here involving Gog and Magog, which are after the millennium and, and right prior to the end of the world, is not the Battle of Armageddon. The Battle of Armageddon took place several chapters earlier. That battle has come and gone in a thousand years at least. If you take it literally and figuratively, more than a thousand years have passed. Since the Battle of Armageddon. That's important because, you know, one's before the millennium, one's after the millennium. Even if you're premillennialist, uh, you still have a thousand years to separate these two battles. You have, in their mind, a rapture, seven years of tribulation, the coming of the Lord and setting up the millennium. A thousand years later, this happens. So you got a thousand years, minimal, between these two battles. So the Battle of Armageddon is not this battle, and vice versa. And a lot of people get confused. They talk about you know the coming Battle of Armageddon, I get, and, and as if it's the last battle, this battle uh, that's taking place. And of course, um, that no eschatological system can make them the same battle. I don't. Uh, I don't care if it's. Uh, Preterist or any other system, dispensational or otherwise, they're separate battles. So that's important to keep in mind. But there is the question of whether these are uh, a literal geographic area that this, uh, it's going to take place in. And I, to some degree, I've made the case that it could be a, li a literal geographic place because of the terminology used. Now I'd like to make the case that it might not be that. That instead, what we have here is actually uh, Jerusalem utterly destroyed just a, um, in the last chapter, chapter 19. It doesn't exist scripturally. And I say it doesn't exist scripturally because we know that uh, Jerusalem was rebuilt. And, and, and nobody's questioning that. But it is not biblical Jerusalem that's rebuilt. That covenant, the old covenant, has ended. It doesn't exist anymore. It's replaced with the new covenant. And uh, the new covenant is a worldwide general, uh, uh, general covenant to the world as a whole. And it has no geographic center. There is no holy city in Christianity, notwithstanding some who believe there is, whether it's in Rome or... Jerusalem or someplace else. In fact, there's no holy city in, in, in Christianity except one. What would be that one? The New Jerusalem is the only holy city mentioned, and we're going to discuss that actually in the next chapter. And, but that does play a role here in this chapter. Why? Well, you've got to figure John, who's only a few verses away from discussing the New Jerusalem, does have in his mind this topic when he talks about the camp of the saints and the beloved city. I mean, that's a similar terminology. He knows the old Jerusalem is destroyed. He's just told us that. He knows he's going to be talking about the new Jerusalem in just a few verses. And then he, he uses this terminology. First of all, let's make clear, if, there, if he was referring to a uh, physical Jerusalem and... Uh, Chapter 20, where we're at. It's not the new Jerusalem. Because when we read its dimensions and read its character, they're not at all similar to the Jerusalem we have now on the earth. You see what I'm trying to say? Entirely different entities. So what Jerusalem would he be referring to? The one he's getting ready to talk about in more detail. He's getting ready to talk about the new Jerusalem. 
the church of Jesus Christ. That's the one that's under attack here at the end of time. Now what helps us clarify that, he talks about this army coming up around the camp of the saints. Uh, now the, the camp existed in a, 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 the saints, existed only in a 40 year period during the wilderness wanderings, when there was a camp, you see. And uh, the, the uh, tabernacle was there, and the uh, tribes were laid out in a somewhat symmetric pattern around the tabernacle, and they camped for 40 years as they dwelt in the wilderness. Now that's come and gone. Now the question is, you said, well, there's going to be you know, a rebuilt Jerusalem, a rebuilt temple. Is there going to be a rebuilt camp? You say, that doesn't fit. Well, you know, he appears to be using symbolic language here because he's not uh, telling us that there's going to be some, you know, if there was a rebuilt camp, it would really be in opposition to Jerusalem. You've got to make up your mind. Where is the community of faith? In the camp or in Jerusalem? You see what I'm trying to say? He's using terms, however, both of which say the community of faith. The community of faith is going to be under attack. The people of God. And that's the point I'm trying to make. He's using uh, somewhat you know, historic and literal terminology that we can grasp. But he will flesh out this Jerusalem thing in the next couple of chapters and help us understand that this is the community of faith that's under attack in this last day. Now, I, I can readily see why, how somebody could say, I just don't buy that, and I'm going to go with some type of literal, physical army of who knows how many millions that are going to come up in the you know, uh, last days into the uh, land of Israel, and God's going to kill them all. Well, I can see your case. I don't subscribe to it. I think it misses the point. Uh, the point being that uh, the book of Revelation is about a tale of two cities, one destroyed, and the other put before our eyes as the new community of faith. And it has no geographic limitations other than for the purpose of building a picture for us to get some sense in which Satan is going to attack the community of faith in a very effective way in the last day. Any questions about that for me? That I'm persuasive, persuasive, somewhere in the middle. What are your thoughts about that? Anything? Okay. Then we will uh, move on. And fire came down from heaven and devoured them. So, uh, this is a short battle in some sense. There's some type of undefined revolt. And, and all this is, is obscure. And the reason it's obscure is because it is in the future. Almost anything in the book of Revelation, you can go back in history to the writers of the first century who provided political and uh, <coughs> economic and military uh, social history that we can identify as being spoken of in the book of Revelation. But when you get to this point uh, in, in which we've come really to the end of the world, that hasn't happened yet. And therefore, we can't quite be sure, shall we say, how this plays out because so few words are given to us. You know, we don't know how uh, this period, it's a relatively short period, but, you know, I don't know what that means. Is that uh, a week, a month, a year that Satan is loose to do this thing and <clears throat> he attacks the community of faith and God destroys him? Being future is difficult to get our hands on. Uh, I would ask you a question. We, we have now come to the end of the world. In fact, verse 11 takes us right into the great white throne judgment. You know the world is over. Now we're being judged. My question to you is this, what happened to the rapture? We know that there's rapture, it's not a biblical term for 
per se rapture, but the concept is biblical because Paul talks about it. the church is caught up, you see, and then it comes back. And we don't read about it here. Now, I don't know why we don't read about it here because it would make my job a lot easier. <laughs> I just point out the verse. You know, this is like what Paul said. Here's John saying it again, and yet John doesn't cover it. He covers this so succinctly that there's just so many things not here. It just gives us, you know, the bare outline. But if there's going to be, and there is, a rapture, notice where it says the, uh, in verse 9, uh, talks about the camp of the saints and the beloved city. And right before the phrase, the fire came down from heaven, right in there, that's where it's going to take place. You see? It's got to take place somewhere, you know, right at the end of time. But before, you know, everything, <laughs> everything's destroyed, you say. And that would be the most logical place for the rapture to take place, right? In the middle of that sentence, if John cared to discuss it, which, uh, you know, he did. But let's just discuss it a little bit. Let's read <clears throat> something from uh, Paul, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, where he says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. So we have a resurrection taking place at some point in the future when, you know, when Paul was writing in the distant future, in which the dead come out of the grave. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we always be with the Lord. So not only will the dead be raised on that day, and that point right here in the book of Revelation, I think that's what's going to happen. But those saints, remember the saints are being surrounded in the communities in which they live and are under attack and are being persecuted, probably martyred, and uh, there's going to be a great genocide of Christianity upon the face of the earth. And just at that time, when they're just ready to whack the heads off of Christians, so to speak, poof, they're gone. The graves open up, the Christians disappear from the face of the earth momentarily on this point. Now what do I mean by momentarily? Notice the word in Thessalonians, meet, to meet the Lord in the air. That word appears two other times in the book, uh, books of the New Testament. And they tell us, I think, exactly what it means. In Acts 28.15, we read, And the brethren, when they heard about us, Paul and his, his entourage, came from as far as the market of Appius and the three inns, some great distance from the seacoast port that Paul had landed at in Italy when he was being taken as a slave, and when Paul saw them, he thanked God and took courage. Now, what happened when these Christians came to meet Paul at the seaport? Their purpose of meeting him was to escort him from that place to Rome. And they did that. They really didn't have any choice because Romans' guards were going to move Paul from there uh, to uh, Rome instantly, so to speak. But they came to meet Paul and, in some sense, escort him, travel with him on those last miles of his journey. How long did it take for that to take place? This is an important point. Did they wait around seven years? You know, I say, why do I say seven years? Because the dispensationalists say that, you know, there's a rapture of the church, and seven years later, after the tribulation, Christ comes back with that church, you see, but my point is here, there's an instantaneous return uh, of this delegation. Uh, let's look at that in a little bit more detail in Matthew 25, 6. But at midnight there was a shout, Behold, the bridegroom, 
come out to meet him. Of course, this is a parable, if you remember from the Gospels, in which Christ is talking about his coming in, in parabolic form. And he talks about how the, the virgins go out to meet the bridegroom. Of course, now what's the focus of the bridegroom? It's on the bride. <laughs> And they're not, I don't think, going to hinder him for seven years. He's got a, a, a mission uh, in mind, and that mission is get to that bride. And so that's an instantaneous thing. They go out to meet the bridegroom to escort him in this party-like festival that's going on. But it's an instantaneous thing. They don't hang around for a long, a long periods of time, especially years. But they instantaneously meet and return to the wedding feast. Now this is typical in this sense. You, from time to time, reading carefully the news, you will read about some important individual that goes to Washington, D.C., and how uh, government officials, sometimes the president himself, will go down to the airport to greet and to, you know, official delegation, and to travel with this important individual, bringing him or her to the White House. You see what I'm trying to say? This is, this is a typical process for, you know, thousands of years that delegations go out and uh, meet and uh, return with personages of importance. Well, that's what the church is doing. A personage of importance, the Lord of the church, the head of the church, the bridegroom, has come. The church goes out to meet him through the rapture. And immediately, like in these other two illustrations, return. The church is snatched up in the midst of this war, this chaos, and instantly comes with Christ as he comes with his armies and destroys Satan. That word isn't, but you know, the passages that we've read make the point that there is going to be a uh, <coughs> resurrection of the dead, and we, if we were you know, yet alive, will be caught up together. The reason I ask is I've heard some, and I've read some people, maybe they don't believe in the rapture, they believe, because it's not a term used, they believe in the second coming, and they're trying to distance themselves. Well, you could use that argument not to believe in the Trinity. The word Trinity is not in the Bible either. But as you study the Bible, you see that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are indeed three persons and one entity, mysterious as it may be, all of which are God and all of which are one. So we get that together from the totality of Scripture and we, and we put a term on it, and if this is the Trinity. Uh, somebody says, well, that's not the Bible, so it doesn't exist. Well, the word's on the Bible, but it does exist, you see. And so, so, so it is with the return of the Lord. The passage was clear. The dead rise. We who are alive, caught up. Put a word out. Let's call it the rapture. And words on the Bible so it doesn't exist. It's still there no matter what word you put on it or don't put on it. You see, the Lord is coming. And, and in those two elements, the resurrection of the dead, and, in some sense, you might say the resurrection of the living. They take place. Paul spells it out. He's saying. And to meet the Lord in the air. And my point is, to meet is the giveaway. Because that word has history. And so if you want that word to mean something other than the history of that word, then you've got to make a good case for it. And I think it's easier for me to make a good case that it's an instantaneous return of the delegation. They went out to meet the coming Lord, who is now coming to judge his creation. Does that, does that make sense to you? I hope. Uh, and the devil who, was de who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are also. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Of course, we read earlier that the beast and the false prophets were, uh, had the unique privilege of being cast into the lake of fire early. 
Now, we don't know that other people weren't cast into the lake of fire earlier than the final judgment, but we don't know that there were or weren't, for that matter. The implication is that only the beast and the false prophet were until the last day. And that the hell-like condition for the rich man, and Lazarus, remember this story, uh, Lazarus, of course, stepped through the veil, opened his eyes, and it was in Abraham's bosom. You know? The rich man, he also died, the Bible says, and opened his eyes, and he was in hell and in torment. So some type of hell exists, some type of heaven exists before the final judgment in which, you know, the, the details of that punishment, the details of that reward take place. You think? And so, and the, apparently the lake of fire is that final uh, judgment. And so uh, the devil is now on that last day cast there, and it says, forever and ever, good words, because we don't want to see him again. He is bound forever and ever in the lake of fire at that point. We were told earlier that he would, you know, be, be uh, released from a certain restrictions. And he was, and the, and the term used was he's cast into the abyss, the bottomless pit, which is not identical with the lake of fire, but that he would be let out. We're now told that he is cast into the lake of fire forever and ever, not a millennium, but he will never be let out, nor will anybody else that joins him. Any questions about that? Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. Now this is the first time we read about a great white throne. Now we read about thrones all through the book of Revelation, but this seems to be a unique setting. And that setting would be the end of the world judgment that takes place. And... Um, <clears throat> Now all are gathered to this great white throne. Uh, in Matthew we read, But when the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all his angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Now there are some similarities there between what we're reading. His angels come with him, and of course they are the great uh, army of God. The Lord of hosts. You've heard that term, Lord of hosts. Host means army. Lord of the armies of God. And he sits on his glorious throne. Uh, Paul says to Timothy, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom. He's going to judge the living and the dead. That's what we are now facing. Those that didn't die, the rapture, those who had died, the dead in Christ rose first. The living and the dead, everybody's going to be there. Nobody's going to be missing. Um, any questions? Verse 12. And I saw the dead. We're back to them again. The great and the small standing, because they're no longer horizontal, they're now vertical. They're standing. Make the point that having been dead, really, they're not dead now, or they wouldn't be standing. Uh, before the throne, everybody's standing before the throne, great and small. And the books were opened, and <clears throat> that's not good. The books are open because they have a record of our behavior. And uh, if we have to be judged from the books that are opened on that last day, we are without hope, simply because we are desperate sinners, rebellious against God, and the books will prove it in detail. But, the good news, and another book was open, yay, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. Now, <clears throat> those who are named found in the book of life, course, they have been judged. It's not that they got off. It's just that somebody else took the punishment. But there was a righteous punishment. God is not unjust to allow some to escape without punishment. All 
sins are punished. It's just a matter of whether a person bears his own sin or whether he has a substitute in Christ to bear that sin. But all sin is punished. Uh, <clears throat> and notice that there is a punishment according to their deeds. The question is often asked, are there you know, levels of punishment in hell or levels of reward in heaven? I think the answer is yes to that. We see in Luke 12, we read, And that slave who knew his master's will and did not get ready or act in accord with his will will receive many lashes, but the one who did not know it and committed deeds worthy of a flogging will receive but few. So you see how, you, you, you see here this uh, parable, I think, teaching the condition in eternity of the loss between uh, many and few. A great punishment and one not as great. And what that consists of in both cases, of course, we don't know. But I think when we know, we don't want to have any part of it. Uh, but there is a just God who judges justly those who are evil. Now, the fact that the Bible speaks of rewards tells us that the opposite is the case, too. That in heaven, we're not all this great uh, egalitarian mass that receive the same reward, no matter how little or much we did for the kingdom. But in fact, uh, we are told that uh, uh, the one who has uh, uh, done well receives more in the kingdom, and the one who has done less receives less. Uh, let's face it. The great saints of the Bible, Abraham, Isaac, Moses, Isaiah, and many more, Paul, uh, they have done so much for God. They suffered so much. They believe so, uh, you know, such a holy faith. And God rewards them accordingly. He rewards all of us. Uh, but there are definitely, uh, uh, heaven's not a, 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 uh, one of these socialistic uh, uh, environments where everything, everybody's equal. Not equal in heaven. I guess they, there are distinctions. What? We're not all winners. <laughs> We're all winners in heaven. Because he made us winners. But we're not all equal in reward. Personally, I'm willing to take whatever shanty that they give me to live in and just be glad I got it. <laughs> no matter where it is. You know, you got this little shanty down by the river of life. It's only 40 or 50 rooms, you know, made of gold of this nature. Well, I'm going to have to just make do, I guess. <laughs> you know, I think anything that happens is going to be pretty, pretty nice. Uh, <clears throat> I'll read you John 5, 28. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and will come forth. Those who did, uh, those who did the good deeds to a resurrection of life and those who committed the evil deeds of resurrection of judgment. Now, what I'm trying to say here and deal with right here, the question is, are there many judgments? Are there many, you know, resurrections? Are there many second comings? Uh, because you have that in dispensationalism. And they will talk about various judgments. They're not sure uh, between themselves which ones there are. But they have a lot of... Uh, you have judgments of the saved, judgments of the lost, judgments of the Gentile, judgments of the Jews. You have the Old Testament believers judge. You have the New Testament believers uh, judge. You have those that died before the rapture, they're judged. Those who died after the rapture, those who died in the tribulation, those who died during the millennium. And how are you going to sort that out and how they sort it out? It's just utterly ridiculous. The Bible really teaches one judgment on the last day and not any of uh, these multiple judgments. But when the wheat sprouted and bore grain, then the tares became evident also. The slaves of the landowner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. The slaves said to them, Do you want us then to, gather, to go and gather them up? And he said, No. For while you are gathering up the tares, you may uproot the wheat with them. Allow both to grow together until the harvest. 
And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, First, gather up the tares and bind them in bundles and burn them up. But gather the wheat into my barn. There is one uh, judgment at the end of time there, although the distinction of two different people being judged. And the nations will be gathered before him. And he will separate them from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he put the sheep on his right hand, the goats on his left. Now that's one judgment in which the lost will be judged and the uh, saved will be rewarded, judged and rewarded. And, but it's one judgment on the last day, not a, not a variety of judgments. Uh, any questions? And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and Hades gave up the dead, which were in them. And they were judged, every one of them, according to their, de their deeds. I'm always, uh, well, more than suspicious, that when my, the modern day man dies, we have this phenomenon. It's not inherently evil, and I don't want you to get that idea. This modern day phenomenon, though, that everybody wants to be cremated. This is utterly contrary to the last 2,000 years of Christian history, in which the body was preserved in honor and, and waiting for the last day of the resurrection. Not that, you know, you had to do that because God calls to the, the sea, and the sea gave, gives up its dead. I mean, it, it's you know, not necessary. It was just an attitude. You see what I'm trying to say? And I think this attempt uh, to uh, destroy the body uh, as the and this cremation thing that's so popular these days, is an attempt to avoid the last judgment. An attempt to uh, avoid accountability for sin. When you die, you die, and it's all over, and God will never find me anyhow, because I'm just going to, you know, be burned up, and, and all my ashes spread to the wind, and lots of luck finding me, as if, what kind of God is that? <laughs> You'd have a hard time with that. You see what I'm trying to say. But in fact, <clears throat> we see death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. And the, excuse me, the sea gave up the dead, which were in them. And death and Hades gave up the dead. You know, death is just a concept of non living. Hades is, means the grave, more often than not. The grave, the sea, death itself uh, cannot hold one when God says, come forth. Everything is going to come forth, you see. It's been said, rightly so, no doubt, that when God told Lazarus, Lazarus, come forth. If he'd left Lazarus' name off, there would have been a big resurrection right there on the spot. You see what I'm trying to say? Everybody would have responded then, as they will on this last day, when he says, come forth. And uh, it will include everybody. The sea gives up its dead. The grave gives up its dead. Death gives up the dead all come to life to stand before that great white throne judgment. I can picture it. You know, it's like, it's white. <laughs> and it's like, you know, 10,000 miles high. You know, and everybody's down there gathered around, and there sits the judge of the universe. Goats on the uh, left, and uh, sheep on the right. <coughs> and and the judgment takes place. However long, I don't know what kind of sense of time take, is, is involved, but there's, and I don't think any of us will get tired, as God does when he's there to do on that last day. And uh, we enter our eternal reward. <clears throat> then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, the last enemy that will be abolished is death. Death itself will cease to exist in God's universe at this point. We cast into the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Those are the conditions, the book of life. The books, in general, don't send you to hell. It's the fact your name is not found in the book of life. You see, that's what sends a person to hell. That book of life, 
was created before the foundation of the earth was ever created. And the names were already pre-written in there, as uh, Paul tells us uh, in, in Ephesians. Before the foundation of the world, we were chosen in Christ Jesus. And our name's written in that book. So, this is how the world ends. Finally, as we study through the book of Revelation, we get to the point where evil is um, finally done away with in God's universe. And, and the lake of fire and the eternal rewards in heaven become the eternal condition of 